Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to finish reading You Don't Know Everything, Jilly P by Alex Gino. We're gonna pick up where we left off after the shooting death of Jessica at the hands of the police. Jessica was one of the kids that, the deaf kids that Jelly met at New Parents Night. And we're gonna pick up with chapter 22. Sunday evening, there's a vigil for Jessica Johnson at Lake Merritt. Mom, Aunt Alicia, Aunt Joanne, and I all go. Dad stays home with Emma, Jamila, and Justin. We park just before sunset. Lake Merritt is huge, at least for the middle of a city. From the south end where we are, you can't really see the far side. In fact, it splits in two and you can't see what happens to either fork. When I was little, I used to think the lake was as big as an ocean. We walk along the shoreline. A duck dives under the lake and comes up, shaking drops of water off its bill. For an instant, the world feels light. Then the moment passes and I remember why we're here. Jessica Johnson. A few hundred people have gathered into a mass of bodies, signs, bicycles, and candles, some of which are already lit. Many of them face a wind stage that's been constructed on the sidewalk. The sun is still in the sky, but it looks ready to drop in the court onto the court building and roll out of sight. The air is sprinkled with the murmurs of a dozen conversations and low voices, but the usual shouts of laughter being at the park are absent. A few groups are signing, mostly clustered to the right of the stage. The mass of people tapers off on either side into a single row stretching out along the, the lakefront. I wonder how many bodies it would take to line the whole lake. I wonder if Derek is in the constellation of grief. Aunt Alicia, Aunt Joanne, Mom, and I join the people flanking the water. An old man with a curved spine and wrinkly hands walks down the line, passing out short white candles. Each one is stuck into a small paper cup to protect the holder from wax drippings. His baseball cap is bright orange and it tints the white bits of his hair that stick out the sides. We each take a candle. Not long after that, a woman's amplified voice welcomes us from the stage, thank thanking us for coming. She introduces herself as Cat. Off to the right, a tall woman interprets into sign language. We will hear from a few select speakers, including Wilfred and Annalise Johnson, Jessica's parents. The crowd applauds their attendance. I start clapping the way I have, but switch to the deaf clap when I'm reminded by the groups of people by the stage shaking their hands in the air. Mom joins me. Cat continues, then we will hold a full seven minutes of silence to acknowledge the seven bullet wounds found in Jessica's body. After that point, the mic will be open for anyone who wishes to speak. Cat welcomes the grandmother of Ella Davila, who was killed by a cop in Santa Rosa three months ago when she was walking home from the corner store. I want to be polite and listen to her, but she talks so quietly and there's so much noise from the gathering crowd that it's hard to hear what she's saying except when she calls out to her granddaughter's name and her voice is up over the lake. Ella, we miss you. A man speaks after that and then a woman. Both of them also have family members who have been killed by police, a daughter and a nephew. The stories sound different but also the same. His daughter was hanging out in a mall parking lot with her f with their friends. Her nephew was driving to an early shift at work. None of the people who were killed knew they'd ever, they'd never have another chance to see their family and friends. Then it's Jessica Johnson's parents' turn. They look as though the joy has drained out of their body. Nothing how they looked at new parents' night. Jessica's dad stands quietly as Jessica's mom speaks at the mic. I don't know how many of you know Jessica, but she was smart. And I mean smart. Funny too. She looks up at the sky. Jessica was my baby, and they took her from me, my only child, shot her and killed her right in the streets of our neighborhood, and I'll never forgive them, but I want you to know that Jessica was a fighter, and we're going to fight too. She looks over at her husband and puts out her hand for him to grasp, for Jessica and for all our kids. Jessica, my sweet baby, you will never be forgotten. Mom squeezes my hand. Then Kat gets back on the microphone. She reminds people to stay quiet for the full seven minutes of silence, not to sign and to leave their phones in their pocket. She encourages people to think about Jessica and the other victims of police violence. The sun has fallen behind us, its last glimmer of light drifting over downtown Oakland. The evening is quiet except for the street traffic behind us and the occasional cry of someone whose grief has overwhelmed them. Even 
the shift of a bag and shuffle of shoes that goes in the darkening lake. Seven minutes is going to be a long time to be still. Aunt Joanne pulls her arm around Aunt Alicia, who is shaking silently. Around us, the lights of a hundred small flames reflect onto the faces of people that hold them. Eyes are focused downward on candles, ground, the lake. Many faces are wet. A few people are looking off into space, but I'm the only one looking around. And then I feel kind of bad because I'm supposed to be thinking about Jessica Johnson and Elidge Vila and the others. But looking around at the candles in our hands reminds me of the candles on a birthday cake. And that makes me realize that none of the people who have b b ever been killed, who have been killed, are ever going to have another birthday wish. Because they were black. And police, the very people who were supposed to protect us, killed them. It makes me wonder who us is, because I can't imagine being hurt by police. But the black people here can. I think about Aunt Alicia, Justin, and Jamila. I think about Derek. I think about Sword Wielder 42 and Sheila, who sits next to me in social studies, and my old bus driver, Chris. Any one of them could be killed by a cop. Any one of them could disappear at any moment. That's when I notice I'm crying. I let the tears fall. Thank you, Cat finally says. Heads lifts, hands unclasp, necks roll and stretch, and murmurs grow as people turn back towards the stage. Cat introduces Reverend Dubois, a pastor from a church in West Oakland. He's a tall man wearing a full suit and hat with a small feather tucked into the band. His candle lights half of his face with a soft orange glow. He talks about the importance of gathering to grieve and the value of coming together to support each other. He mentions peer counseling and other resources for people who need them and reminds us about upcoming events and rallies. And now before we move on to open comments, says Kat, I'd like to welcome Deaf Beats, a dance troupe from the California School for the Deaf in Fremont, where Jessica was a senior. A group of 20 teenagers wearing black and orange quickly assembles into a block of four by five in front of the stage. Derek is one of them in the third row on the right. They stomp their feet in unison, clap their hands in a rhythm, and raise their fists with deaf pride. Then they turn and do it again, four times in all, one in each direction. Their percussive claps and stomps echo across the lake. After that, they get into a long line facing us. They look up and down the row, and then as one, they start to sign. Over and over again, someone starts chanting in English, in time with the signers. Protect deaf black lives. Others join her, and then I do too. Protect deaf black lives. Protect deaf black lives. Protect deaf black lives. Then the action is over and we're all soaking in the wash of hurt and anger and struggle to find hope together. Kat welcomes the first open mic speaker and invites everyone else who has something to say to see her. I don't see Derek again until he's in front of me, asking if I want to go for a walk. I let mom know which way we're going and me meander away from the group. I didn't know you were going to perform, I say. I don't know the signs, but I see, speak slowly and point back up at the stage. That was really powerful. I give a thumbs up, which isn't as strong as I feel about it, but he smiles. We didn't have a lot of time to rehearse, he speaks as he signs, but we wanted to do something for Jessica. That was the first time I've seen you dance. You were really good. Thanks, I can do way better. He runs several steps in front of me and then breaks into a quick dance number, throwing his hips and hands around. It puts the baby sister slide to shame. He looks so happy, I laugh and then I cry. What, he asks, is my dancing that bad? No, I'm scared something terrible might happen to you too, like it did to Jessica, I say. Derek cocks his head and then shakes it and pulls out his cell phone. He types something and hands me the phone to open it to an open to a text screen with the words, type what you said. I do, and then I hand back the phone. He reads my note and nods his head in understanding. He types back, I'm scared too, every day, terrified some days, but all I can do is keep watching out and keep living and dancing. I nod and he nods. He does another dance move. This one is softer and slower, a bit sadder. Then he puts his phone back into his pocket and extends his hand. I slip mine between his thumb and his palm. We stand together looking at the lake until Derek turns to me and signs with his free ha hand. I'm going to go. I just wanted to say hi. Oh, okay then. I nod. Hug? Derek asks, his eyebrows high. We hug and he smells like mint. For a moment we feel connected and I don't want to let go. 
but then he drops his arms and I drop mine. He smiles, says goodbye, and walks off into the crowd. For a moment I lose him, but then I spot him again. His parents and his two little sisters are here. His mom takes him in her arms, and he puts his head on her shoulder while his dad rubs his back. His sisters join in the family embrace. I'm glad we're here to support Je Jessica's family and Derek and everyone who knows someone who was killed by police. It feels important that we're remembering them by being here, even if we only met them once or even not at all. We're remembering that they were alive and that there are people who care about them very much, who are missing them so much it aches, another stab without every breath. I walk back and cozy up close to mom, Aunt Alicia, and Aunt Joanne, and we have a family hug of our own, resting on one another in the candlelight. Chapter 23. It's a quiet ride home. I watch Maya the canary's cage swinging back and forth below Aunt Alicia's rear view mirror and the way she hangs back at an angle as we go up the big hill to our place. Mom invites him to come inside and stay for a bit, but Aunt Joanne has to work early in the morning. Mom and I say goodnight to Aunt Alicia while Aunt Joanne goes into the house to get Jamila and Justin. Thanks for the ride, Mom says. Anytime, says Aunt Alicia. Stay safe. I'll do what I can. Jamila and Justin come out of the house yelling and running for the car. It's good they didn't come to the vigil. I think about them trying to be quiet for seven minutes in a row. I'm not sure that Justin has been quiet for seven minutes in his life. Mom and I hug Aunt Joanne and head inside. How was it, Dad asks, Emma resting in his arms. On the pause television screen, a man is standing in a suit yelling at another man in a suit who's sitting at a desk. The standing man is practically pointing his finger at the sitting man's face. Both men are white and I notice that I notice that. It was good, I say automatically, and then I shake my head. No, wait, it wasn't good at all. It was terrible. It was really, really sad. I mean, Jessica Johnson got shot by a cop, and she's not the only one. Black kids keep getting shot, and it's awful. Police are supposed to keep us safe. You're right, they are, says Dad. We, couldn't have, we shouldn't have even had to be there, I say. Jessica Johnson should be alive, running wherever she wants, and it's not just her. I want to say more, and I don't know what exactly, but I'm filled with anger, which is also hurt. I worry about Justin and Jamila all the time, says Mom. Every time I hear one of those stories in the news, I think about them. Can't imagine the strength Aunt Alicia must have to get through the day. Then I ask the questions that's been forming in my mind for months. Why don't we talk about this stuff more? I probably talk more about racism with Aunt Alicia than I do with you, and you're my parents. Mom doesn't say anything. Dad's face get, gets a puzzled look. Then he opens his mouth, but he doesn't say anything either. I guess we just didn't want to worry you, says Mom. I'm worried anyway, I say. So what do we do? We keep talking, says Mom. Dad nods, even when it's uncomfortable. Especially when it's uncomfortable, says Mom. Okay, I say, but what do we do? We could make a donation to an organization, says Dad. Money's important, I guess, but I want to do something. Like what, Mom asks. Like the vigil, but not just for one day. I want to make sure that people know that racism is still a big problem. I mean, black people already know it, but what about here in Piedmont? Most of our neighbors are white like us. I want more people to talk about it. We sit together quietly for a moment until mom's head pops up with an idea. What if we put a sign on the lawn? I like it, says dad, drawing out the words. Like a Black Lives Matter sign? I ask. I've seen them around Oakland, but I've never seen one on our street. Exactly like that, says mom. I mean, it's a small gesture, but it'll say that we see what's happening. Maybe it'll encourage people to do a little thinking and talking of their own, says dad. Yes, 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 I say. A sign doesn't save anyone's life, but it lets people know that we're thinking about it and that they can too. Dad prints out a sign on a piece of paper and we tape it to a pair of metal skewers from the kitchen. Mom says that she'll get something more permanent soon, but as of now, the Perillo family of Oakland Avenue and Piedmont officially declares that Black Lives Matter. Aunt Alicia and Aunt Joanne were right. Things haven't been the same since Emma was born. All of our paths have changed in ways that we never could have expected. I've made some mistakes along the way, but I also learned a lot. And I don't just mean American Sign Language, even though I reached a hundred words today. I've learned that what you say matters and that you can hurt people even when you don't mean to. I've learned that sometimes you have to help someone start a rough conversation, even if that person is an adult. 
even if those people are your parents. I've learned that racism is still around today. It's in the police and it's in my family. I've learned that people who are angry are often hurt and that sometimes the most important thing that you can do for someone in pain is to listen. And I've learned that there's so much, there's no such thing as being done learning. But maybe I learned enough that I'll manage not to make the same mistakes again. I wonder what mistakes I'll make next. Nine months later. Mom, Dad, Emma, and I are the first to arrive at Fenton's Creamery for Emma's birthday. I convinced Mom and Dad that Fenton's was the perfect place to celebrate now that Emma is old enough for her first taste of ice cream. I've been signing ice cream to her all week. She doesn't get what the excitement is about, but she will soon. Macy shows up a few minutes later. Her mom dropped her off early to help decorate and will be coming to the party itself. H-E-B, J.D., and a happy Emma's birthday to you too, Dad says, translating for Mom and me. Mom hands me and Macy a bag of crepe paper streamers and strings of letters that spell out happy birthday. A lanky white boy with short blonde curls shows us to the private party room. Macy and I decorate while Mom and Dad meet the staff. Emma hangs out on a blanket with some blocks, but every once in a while she tries to crawl away. Macy and I take turns bringing her back to the blanket and distracting her with the blocks so she doesn't get right back up again. Aunt Alicia and Aunt Joanne are the first guests to show up, with hugs and kisses and a big box for Emma. Jamila and Justin see the open room as an opportunity to run circles around and between the empty tables, and they do, almost knocking Macy and me over as we try to hang balloons from the ceiling. Emma starts crawling after them and gets completely under a table before Mom spots her and brings her back to her blanket. Looks like the sack of potatoes method isn't going to work anymore, says Aunt Alicia. It's so much harder once they don't stay where you put them. Justin, Jamila, stop running inside. Aunt Lou, Uncle Saul, Annie, Matt, and Jaden arrive next, followed by Graham. Now that Matt and Trip J are together, they're pretty much unstoppable. Macy and I find a corner to watch from safely as they chase each other around chairs between adults until Aunt Lou pulls out a beanbag toss tic-tac-toe game that keeps them occupied. The rest of the guests arrive, along with more presents, greeting, and hugs. Macy's mom shows up. So do two of Emma's deaf baby friends from her playgroup, one accompanied by her deaf parents and the other by his hearing mom. The parents put the babies in a circle on the floor where they look at each other and chew on plastic toys that their parents give them. The last to arrive is Adriana, Uncle Mike's daughter. I'm so glad you make it, made it, says Graham. I wouldn't miss it. Now that she has her driver's license, she's been coming to our house to babysit Emma. I talked to your dad the other day. I'm sorry, says Adriana with a grin. That man does not know how to grow. He's no better than his father was. I'm glad you're not like him. Me too, says Adriana. Overall, the party is a pretty standard party. The adults sit around and chat until the food is ready, and then the kids join the table and the adults talk more about how much Emma and Jaden have grown recently, about how nicely Macy and I are maturing. The promise of ice cream keeps Matt and Trip J relatively quiet and mostly in their chairs for the meal. After eating, Adriana and Annie set up a game of pin the tail on the donkey for the kids who can walk, which works out to be M and Trip J. Macy and I decided it would be more fun to watch than play. Justin is so excited for his turn, he's literally jumping in place as he waits. Once each of the kids has been spun around and sent in search of don the donkey romp three times, Aunt Alicia tells them to stop. If you get so dizzy you can't eat ice cream, you're not going to like it. So Em and Trip J go back to running around in between chairs and relatives until they get yelled at to stop. Mom announces that the ice cream is minutes away and we will, will only be offered to people who know how to behave indoors. That quiets them down and they go back to playing beanbag tic-tac-toe. So here's the question, Aunt Joanne asks. I know happy, but how do you sign birthday? There is a couple of different size. signs, says the hearing mom from Emma's playgroup. I like this one. She holds her five fingers stretched out with a middle one bent. She touches the middle finger to her chin and then her chest. She consults with a deaf couple who nod and then sign birthday as well. Soon, the table is filled with middle fingers tapping chins and chests. Birthday, birthday, birthday. What about happy, asks Macy's mom. Joanne may know it, but I don't. I can handle that one. Dad holds out his hand 
with his fingers close together as if he's going to pat his belly, and he almost does, but with his hand brushing upward, like he's scooping happiness out of his heart and splashing it on his face. Happy, happy, happy. The hearing mom of Emma's baby friend asks how we sign Emma, and mom shows her how we shake the letter E in the air. She'll get a name signed from the deaf community someday, I explain, but that's what we use for now. Everyone around the table, even Emma, is signing Emma. Emma, 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 Emma. Graham has a funny look on her face, and I'm nervous that she's going to complain that this is all so hard to learn. But then she asks, maybe you all know this one already, but how do you sign to you? Half a dozen fingers point at Graham at once. Oh, Graham laughs. That's not so tough. And with that, we're ready for ice cream. When the ice cream does arrive, it comes in large glass serving dishes placed along the center of the table, along with nuts, chocolate bits, and a dozen other goodies in small bowls, as well as hot fudge, whipped cream, and even a bunch of bananas. We're each going to make our own sundaes, and it's going to be epic. But first we sing, and sign. Ha, dad cues, and we all join in singing and signing. Happy birthday to you. Everyone points at Emma, who mostly looks surprised. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Emma. Only the deaf couple signs dear, but we all wave our E's in the air. Happy birthday to you. And many more, Dad croons. Mom takes a small spoonful of vanilla ice cream and drops it onto Emma's tongue. Her eyes go wide and she bangs her palms on the table. She pops her mouth open for more. Then we all make ourselves sundaes so big we can barely finish them, but so delicious we have no choice. Three months after that, Aunt Alicia pulls up at a two-story building on a side street off MacArthur Boulevard, so deep, into, so deep east into Oakland that we're almost in San, San Leandro. The building is lined with balconies, some filled with plants and chairs, and one packed solid with kids' toys and furniture. A bald man is taking a leisurely Saturday morning walk with his dog, while a family across the street with three adults and at least three children pile into a minivan. I text Derek, and a minute later, he's stepping out of his front door and into the back seat of our car. He has to duck his, his head on the way in. He's wearing a black Dahlia t-shirt, jeans, and a black baseball cap with a pin on the side that says, I remember Jessica. Hi, Jay. He speaks as he signs, as usual, and waves to Aunt Alicia. Thanks for taking us to the bookstore. You're welcome, Aunt Alicia signs back. Nice to meet you. She and Aunt Joanne have been taking sign glasses, and they're getting pretty good. Derek gives a surprised smile. Nice to meet you, too. Ready, she asks. I don't remember the sign for ready. Ready. Derek flicks the wrist of his R-shaped hands. Oh, right. Ready. Seatbelts buckled. She doesn't sign the question, but she tugs at her shoulder strap. We both nod. Aunt Alicia turns face forward and taps Maya the canary and gets on the highway going towards downtown. I point at Derek's pin, the pin that Derek's waning. Jessica was killed about a year ago, wasn't she? I sign as I speak. A year and eight days. What happened to her was awful. You must miss her. He nods. No one should feel unsafe from the cops like that. He nods again, and then he takes my hand in his. I give it a squeeze to say I see him, and we ride quietly downtown. Aunt Alicia hums along to an old song on the radio. At first, I think she doesn't know what we're talking about, but then she catches my eye in her rearview mirror and gives me a quick nod of approval. The trip to Laurel Bookstore doesn't take long. It's a bright day, and the downtown Oakland buildings shimmer yellow and orange as we zoom around an elevated curve and off the highway. Beast-like cranes prepper the ports by the water, and San Francisco looks small in the distance. We park and cross the red brick plaza towards the bookstore. The door still reads closed, so we stare at the sign in the window announcing that roses and thorns will go on sale today, looking at the cover for clues. We've been talking about the cover for months since it was released, trying to figure it out. There's nothing new to see, but now that we're moments from finding out what's happening, we're searching for every last hint. Cecil the Basilisk is peering a scaly orange head from behind a foggy mountain while Gwinella huddles in a cave below. And either Othor or Maglin, it's hard to tell which, is rowing a boat across the moonlit lake. I'm pretty sure it's Maglin since it looks like he's rowing towards Gwinella, but Derek thinks that it's Othor about to attack Cecil. 
We agreed that if he tried, he would lose and probably get swallowed whole in the process. The rower's hue is yellow-green, so it really could be either of them. Guinella has our usual yellow aura, but it's Cecil's orange glow that feels like it's shining right off the page. What about Blinky? Aunt Alicia asked, slowly fingerspelling the trickster chameleon's name. I don't see her on the cover at all. Who cares about Blinky? asked Derek. Everyone has a role to play, Aunt Alicia says. Derek shakes his head and looks at me to interpret, but I shrug my shoulders and shake my head. I don't know how to sign anything that complicated yet. Take out your phone and type it, I say to Aunt Alicia. She does and shows it to Derek, who types back, true, and how do you know about Blinky? I've read the books, Aunt Alicia signs proudly. Then she says carefully, pointing at the book in the window, and I'm going to read this one as soon as Jilly's done with it. That will be soon, says Derek. He's right. We found out how many pages there are in the book, and we made a reading schedule. We've even included time to check in online and talk about what we think. We should be done before school on Monday. I didn't know you were that excited, I say. I thought you said that the world is filled with great stories just waiting to be read. Yeah, well, maybe this is one of them. Aunt Alicia shrugs, and the morning light catches one of the dozen thin purple dreads that pepper her hair. Derek looks at me with raised eyebrows. He hands me his cell phone, and I type out what Aunt Alicia and I just said. I can't wait until Emma's old enough to say more than a word or two at a time. Derek promises me that my signing will get a lot better once Emma starts having real conversations. Soon, a woman with a button-down shirt, determination in her step, and a genuine smile comes outside. She props up a chalkboard sandwich sign that says Roses and Thorns by B.A. Delacour is on sale today in bright colors. Come in. She holds the door open for us and we don't even need to ask where the book is. There's a big cardboard display as soon as we enter with about a dozen copies beaming up at us. I take one from the middle row and Derek takes one from the row above and we go directly to the counter. Are you sure this is the book you want? Says the woman behind the counter with a mischievous smile. You didn't even look at our philosophy section. Nope, this is the one. I pay for my copy with mom's debit card that she let me borrow for the day and Derek pays for his with cash. Aunt Alicia is checking out the cooking section. We go to wait outside. What did she say? Derek asked me when we step out of the bookstore. I pull out my phone. She teased us and because we were fast. It wasn't funny. What did she say? Derek asks again, throwing weight into the word say. I type her comment and show it to him. That's not funny, he says. I know. He smiles, and that makes me laugh. We sit on the low stone plaza wall across the way from the bookstore and pull out our identical copies to get reading. We even turn the pages at almost the same time and get to page 15 before Aunt Alicia comes out. Aren't you two a sight, she says, holding a thick paperback that she pops into her bag. I tap Eric on the elbow, and he, he looks up. Brunch? she asks. Yes, I nod eagerly. Derek shakes his head, but with a crinkly face that says he didn't understand her, not that he isn't interested in food. Brunch, I fingerspell. B-R-U-N-C-H. Waffles, I promise not to help you order. Oh, I love brunch, he says. We walk over to Rudy's Camp Fail Cafe with Aunt Alicia, hugging our copies of Roses and Thorns. As soon as we figure out what we want to eat, we'll get back to reading. We didn't include a time at the diner in our schedule. I hope you'll at least stop when the food comes, says Aunt Alicia, signing enough that Derek nods. Of course, Derek says. We don't want to get anything on our books. He rubs his hand along the cover, feeling over the bumps of the mountain, down Cecil Scales, along the water, and back up again. We open our copies and return to Vidalia, leaving Aunt Alicia to pull out her own book. The waiter appears at the table with two-inch spiky green hair, large holes in his ears, and a cheery, Can I start you folks with anything? Aunt Alicia orders first, eggs benedict and a coffee. I order my favorite, French toast and a large orange juice. Derek gets a waffle, of course. He points at his ear and shakes his head, and then his menu for, his menu for a waffle with a side of bacon. The waiter nods, his hair bouncing back and forth. The waiter points at the drink option, but Derek taps his water glass. When the waiter leaves, Derek turns to me and says, no pickles. I blush and for a minute I worry, but then he punches me lightly in the arm. Vidalia, he asks, what? There's a sign for V-I-D. My finger spelling is slow and Derek answers before I can finish. 
It's the sign for the onion, he grins and signs it again. I copy him, and so does Aunt Alicia. And then Aunt Alicia laughs. Onion, she says. I get it. I don't, I say. Vidalia is a kind of onion, she explains to me. Wow, ASL sure is creative. Aunt Alicia doesn't know the sign creative. Derek turns to me, and this one I, I can do. ASL is creative, I sign. Yes, Derek beams. Then he opens his book and is lost in Vidalia. I'm right behind him. Gwinella is just realizing that Cecil has Magdalene locked up when the food comes. The smell of French, fresh French toast is pulling me from Gwinella's panic, but I at least need to finish the paragraph. I had to read that last sentence three times because it's so loud in here. Not a problem for me, Derek grins, and now it's my turn to punch him in the arm. Brunch is delicious, of course. I'm surprised how easy it is to sign while eating. I was worried that forks and things would get in the way, but it works out, and you don't have to worry about chewing with your mouth open, so that's pretty cool. But I can't type stuff on my phone without getting maple syrup on it, so it's hard to get into the details of what we think about roses and thorns so far. A woman, older than mom but younger than Graham, stops at her table while they're eating. She is wearing a black silk shirt and a necklace made of large red beads. Your son and his girlfriend look very happy together, she says to Aunt Alicia. Oh, says Aunt Alicia, pulling her head back in surprise and letting out, letting out an odd noise. Oh, um, no, 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 no. The woman disappears before Aunt Alicia can stop shaking her head long enough to explain. The Derek looks at me, but I'm too busy laughing to try to interpret what the woman says. It's a laughter that's part re regular funny and part awkward funny and part Aunt Alicia looks funny right now and double part embarrassment. I didn't even know where to start correcting her, Aunt Alicia says. What's happening? Derek asks. I'm still laughing too hard to say anything. So Aunt Alicia wipes her hands on her napkin, pulls out her phone and types to Derek and soon he's laughing too. Aunt Alicia joins us and we're all still smacking the table and sputtering half sentences. Things like, where did she? And she must have thought. And if anyone's staring at us, we're having too much fun to notice. Derek and I finish our schedule, keep to our schedule and finish Roses and Thorns at 11 p.m. on Sunday night. By the end, Vidalia enters a peace, age of peace and joy. The land is saved and Cecil of Asclisk is banished from the realm. Arthur and Blinky end up bound by a magical spell that keeps them within 10 feet of each other for all eternity. Even Derek feels bad for Arthur over that one. Gwinella goes through the toughest time of any character in the book, hands down. By the end, she glows as orange as Cecil. But she's made the right choices for Vidalia, and Magli knows the truth behind her hue, and they are very happy together. Three years after that. Emma and I are watching TV. She can't read closed captions yet, but we're watching a show in which adults run obstacle courses, including a mud river and a grease step slide, so it's not like it matters what anyone's saying. A guy in bright yellow sneakers runs the length of the diving board, but misses the end and falls splat first into a pool of whipped cream. Emma's boisterous giggle makes me laugh even harder than I already am, and then she seals, sees me laughing and bursts into a new peel, even though the show is broken to commercials and all we're watching now are a series of families with perfect hair convincing us that only our products will get the countertop back to its whitest white. We calm down by the beginning of the next commercial, in which kids pull grape juice out of the fridge and spill half of it onto the floor to disapproving prowns and a declaration of the importance of the right paper towel. The big picture makes me thirsty, and I head to the kitchen to pour myself a glass of orange juice. Once there's something in my stomach, I realize how hungry I am. I shout in Emma's direction and sign, are you hungry? Emma nods happily. Her cochlear implants work great for getting her attention, but she understands people better when they sign to her, and she's at a lot clearer when she signs than when she talks. Do you want a JP, PB, and J? I love fingerspelling. JP, PB, and J with its pinky swoop at the beginning and the end. She nods again. Then like a thought, then a thought bubble pops into her head and she perks up and she jumps out of her chair running towards me. Wait, wait, wait. What? I make mine. Emma signs with her little round kid hands. But you're not allowed to use a knife. Give me a spoon, she demands. You get two plates, two spoons, and a knife for me. Emma gets the peanut butter and jelly from the cabinet. What's wrong with the way that I make a PB and J? I mean, the sandwich is named for me after all. Emma just shakes her head and pulls out a loaf of bread. No seeds, no nuts, she signs. At least I got that part right. 
I take out two slices of bread and then lay them out side by side on my plate. Emma does the same. Then I spread a dollop of peanut butter on half of one of the slices. So does Emma, who manages to do pretty well with her spoon. But when I spread jelly on the other half of the slice, Emma shakes her head again. Now what? Emma pulls out her hand like a surgeon calling for the clamp. I place the handle of the spoon in her palm. She, drag she digs into the jelly and drops the spoonful on the other slice of bread. She spreads it over half the slice, and then with a clever grin, she folds over each of the pieces of the bread on themselves. For a girl too young to use a knife, she sure is sharp. Two sealed sandwiches, and nothing mixing with anything, not even in the middle. They look like beautiful pillows of deliciousness on our plate. Mine looks crude in comparison. Turns out the way to improve a JP PB&J sandwich is to make it a JP and EP PB&J. Two peanut butter we sign. Then we tap our sandwiches together and each take a bite. Two jelly. And that's the end of You Don't Know Everything, Jelly P by Alex Gino. I hope you enjoyed listening to this story and we'll see you again next week for more books. Bye.